Alright, we're on the tabernacle tonight and we are doing a continuation on the metals of the tabernacle. Uh, we started with brass uh, last Sunday or last Wednesday, whatever night it was. And uh, tonight we're doing a continuation of that. We're going to pick up there at Acts chapter 9. Now we said that the brass in the tabernacle as a metal represents the suffering, specifically the suffering of Christ. Um, and also you as a believer suffering for the Lord uh, because you are connected to Christ. So we're going to continue looking at some scriptures in regards to suffering, in connection to the Lord's suffering, and in connection with our suffering with Him, and show you that it is imperative that uh, Christians not only uh, believe on Christ, but they should suffer for Him. And when it says suffer for Him, it means that we are to put this flesh down and walk in the Spirit. Um, with a walk in the Spirit. And that means that when your flesh doesn't want to do something that you know you're supposed to do for the Lord, you put that flesh down and you do it anyway. That's suffering for the Lord. Uh, when it's time to pray and you, your flesh says, I don't feel like praying, you pray anyway. Uh, when you're up on Sunday morning and uh, you're rolling out of the bed and your flesh says, I don't want to get up. And I don't want to come to church. You make that flesh come to church because you're suffering for the Lord. Now, if you don't suffer for the Lord, the Bible says you won't reign with Him. I showed you that last week. Um, our reigning is contingent on what we do for the Lord in this body. Now, a lot of Christians are going to get highly disappointed when they find out at the judgment seat of Christ that they lost their reward of reigning with Christ because they refuse to put this flesh into subjection. And uh, that's going to be a pretty big thing. It's going to be a big deal. And uh, it don't may, maybe don't seem like it now, but it will when, when it comes time to, to receive it. I remember when I was in school, a lot of times, you know, the teachers would say, if you do certain things, you know, you'll, you're going to get this reward at the end of the, um, the grading season. And uh, you'll get to go on a field trip, or you'll get to go to this thing or that thing. And while we were slacking off during the class and not doing the things that the teacher told us to do, that stuff started accumulating. And when it came time to pass out the rewards, we were left out. And those of us that were left out realized, oh, wow, that, that was a big deal. I, I wish I could have done that. And you had to sit in the classroom while everybody else was on the field trip enjoying themselves, and you're in the classroom doing schoolwork. And um, it's going to be that much more uh, important that you do what you're supposed to do for the Lord. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Soul winning. You need to be a soul winner every day. Your life should be a soul winning book. You should open your mouth every opportunity you get to invite people to church, give them a gospel track, share the gospel with them, share a scripture with them, and, and try to different tactics that you can use to get them in church and get them in, uh, under the preaching of the Word so that they can get under conviction and get saved. Uh, you're called to be a soul winner. You're not called to sit there and sit on, on that pew like a knot on a log somewhere. When you got saved. God wants you to do something. He wants you to get busy. It's time to get busy. It's time to work. He says you're to work while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. And the night is fastly approaching when we cannot work. And it's going to be time to gather in what we've already done for the Lord. And sad to say, a lot of Christians, when it comes time to gather, they ain't going to have much to pick up. <laughs> I mean, uh, maybe the shirt on their back, if that. Uh, <laughs> some of them are going to walk up to the Lord naked. I'm just telling you, it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. The fire is going to get hot, and you're going to suffer. If you ain't going to suffer now, you're going to suffer then. You're going to suffer. I would rather suffer now and get the reward than to suffer then and not have a reward. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse uh, 16. back to verse um, 10. There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. 
And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Now pay attention to what the Lord says in these next couple of verses. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Now at this point, Saul had already been saved. God had already saved him. Ananias didn't know that. So Ananias is speaking from the perspective, this is a guy that's getting ready to persecute more Christians and he's putting us in jail left and right and he's killing us every opportunity he can. And the Lord answered back to him and corrected him and said, look, he's a chosen vessel. Well, the only way he could be a chosen vessel is if he's a saved vessel. Amen. Amen. He's saved and now he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings, and the children of Israel. Notice the three groups there. Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Paul had a tall order to fill. And look at what verse 16 says. For I will show him, or shew him, how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Let me tell you something. If you're going to do anything for the Lord, you're going to suffer. There's going to be people come your way that's going to cause you to suffer. Either mentally, emotionally, spiritually, um, financially, um, all kinds of ways that you can suffer for the Lord, and the Lord will put all kinds of things in your pathway to see how committed you are to Him. All these people that run around telling you that they're saved and they're Christians and they love the Lord, but they don't ever want to do anything for the Lord and they don't ever want to suffer for the Lord, i got a big question mark in my head about them. Because your heart ought to beat for Christ. You ought to have a desire to not only live for Him, but also suffer for Him and be obedient to Him and walk in His will. That ought, to be your, that ought to be your desire. Don't tell me you love God and aren't willing to do anything for Him. That's a lie. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll what? Keep my commandments. And I can give you a litany of commandments that ain't in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ gave that we as Christians are to keep. <laughs> and they're not in the Old Testament. Let me repeat that again. They're not Old Testament commandments. I can give you 613 of them. I'm giving you things that Jesus Christ said for the New Testament believer to do. Amen. And we need to do it. If you ain't been doing it, you better get busy doing it. Have y'all been paying attention to what's been going on in the news? You been paying attention to Israel? Israel is the, um, is the compass pointing us in where we are in God's timetable. And this stuff that's stirring up in Israel right now is not by accident. I was in the book of Daniel today. I read through the whole book of Daniel today. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. There's some things in Daniel that I'm seeing going on right now that's telling me that we are getting close to the jumping off point. Amen. The hand of Christ is in the wings. Huh? See? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. The hand of Christ is over there right now working behind the scenes. I know He is. We've probably seen Him. He's probably made some appearances on the news and you just didn't know that it was Him yet. Okay? Uh, I'm telling you, what thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> That's what Jesus said. <laughs> I mean, you better do it quick and in a hurry if you want to get anything from the Lord at the end of the day. All right, Acts chapter 26. He's got to suffer for my name, Paul. And boy, Paul suffered. And you know what Paul did when he suffered? He rejoiced. He didn't barely yet can complain about it. He counted it joy. I'm standing out there on that street corner, Brother Earl. It don't bother me a bit that they're over there flicking the finger off at me and stuff and cussing at me and spewing out hatred and telling me they want to kill me and kill my family and stuff like that. I've gotten letters like that before. Oh, yeah. We've had them threaten to come to our house and blow our house up. 
actually did that one. Yeah. I'm not scared of them. I want y'all to know that. I'm not scared of them. I'm not scared of any of them. I don't care how big they are, how tall they are, how much guns they've got. I don't care how much they talk like this. I look at them like this. You can't touch me unless God gives you permission. And if God gives you permission to touch me, then that means it's time for me to go home and I'm ready. Amen. I'm ready to go. I am not scared to go home. Trust me. Um, I have fought a good fight, Paul said. I have kept the faith. Can you say that? Have you finished your course? Have you finished it with honors? That's the key. Don't start something you can't finish. If you start something, like we were talking to Marine Corps, you finish it. No matter if it takes you all night, you're going to finish it. Before you lay your head down, you're going to finish what you started, and if you don't finish it, you don't rest until it's done. Now, if people would have that mindset about their work for the Lord, brother, we could get something done in this country. Amen. Amen. This, this, this generation, and not all of you, I mean, some of, some, some, we got some good people, but they're a remnant, but this generation as a rule, they don't have the same mindset that that old generation had. Amen. When it becomes inconvenient, uncomfortable, and uh, it becomes a bother to them, or it messes up their style, they're ready to lay it down and move on to something else. They're in and out, 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 in everything they do. They're never consistent in anything they do. Never. Brother, when we were coming through the ranks, we raised our sleeves up and we finished what we started. We were in trouble. That's right. And you and your goal was to fish it, finish it with honors. But you better finish it. And that's the way the Lord is. Now look at Acts chapter 26 and verse 23. Verse 23 said that Christ should suffer and that He should be the first to rise from the dead and should shew light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Notice the people there is a reference to the Jews. He calls them the people. And to the Gentiles. Now what's this? That Christ should suffer. It wasn't an option. Christ knew that. He knew that in the garden. When He hit that garden, He knew what was coming. When He was at the Last Supper, taking communion with His disciples, He knew what was about to happen. And He walked that walk, and He finished it. Thank God He's better than some Christians I know. Amen. Amen. Because if He was like some Christians that we know, we wouldn't be saved today. Amen. All right, go to Romans chapter 8. This brass points to a lot of things, folks. All right. uh, Excuse me, Romans 8. 8 17. Look at verse uh, 17 and 18. Let's look at verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, notice the if there, that's conditional, then heirs. You can't be an heir unless you're a child of God. Now you better note that. All these people running around saying, you know, we're all children of God. No, you've got to be a child of God before you become an heir. The Bible says, then heirs, heirs of God, and look at the next thing, and joint heirs with Christ, and that's where people stop, right there. They put a period there. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Are you suffering for Him? Well, no, preacher, I don't like to talk about that stuff. That's negative. I like to stay positive. Well, if you, if you don't read the whole verse, you're going to miss out on something, because you know what the last part of that verse says? If... Everybody say if. If, if. That means it's conditional. So that so be that we suffer with Him. That's when you become a joint heir. 
You're not a joint heir unless you suffer. And that joint heir means that you're going to get an inheritance in the kingdom of God as a person that is reigning with Jesus Christ. If you don't suffer with Him and for Him, you will not reign with Jesus Christ in the millennium. You will not reign with... I'm going to say it one more time. You will not reign with Jesus Christ in the millennium. I don't know what you'll be doing, but you will not be reigning. (laughs) Because the joint heirship of Jesus Christ is contingent upon you suffering with Him. Read the verse. It says it right there plain in English. I don't even have to run to the Greek to explain it. It says it right there in English. Now, you might be an heir of God. That means you have eternal life. But joint heir with Christ? Millennial reign? No, sir. Because that's contingent on something. That's contingent on you getting off your spiritual behind and doing something for the Lord. See, all these Baptists running around telling you you don't have to work, you don't have to work, you don't have to work, you don't have to work. That's partially true. You don't have to work to be saved. In other words, Jesus Christ saved you and He done the work for you to get you saved. I agree with that, 100%. I'm, I'm, I'm at the forefront of preaching that. Y'all have heard me preach many times in this church. You can't do anything to earn your salvation. I agree. But brothers and sisters, the plague among Baptists and independent Baptists and fundamentalists is this. They think because they didn't have to work to get saved, they don't have to do anything after they're saved to please God. Now tell me I'm not telling the truth. They think they are supposed to be spiritually lazy bums. Sit on a pew and that's all I'm required to do. And that's not all you're required to do. If you're going to be a joint heir with Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God in the millennium, you've got to suffer. And that requires you to get out there and do something for Jesus Christ in order for you to suffer. The reason Christians ain't suffering is because they ain't doing anything for the Lord to suffer. You're not offending enough people. (laughs) If you open your mouth and tell them the truth and get them mad, that's where you find out where things are. That's where things get uncomfortable. That's where people start calling you names and you get your flesh gets a little irritated and uncomfortable and then you have to put it under subjection because you don't want to get over there in the carnality and tell them what you really think. Amen. I'm telling you the truth. I've been doing this a long time. I'm telling you how it is. Now, he says if we suffer, if we suffer. Now look at the next part. Paul gives you a a positive note here at the end. Look at what he says. For I reckon, verse 18, that the sufferings, plural, not just one thing, of this present time are not worthy to be compared with with the glory which shall be revealed in us. See, folks, when we think about suffering, don't think about it and zero in on just the suffering. Look beyond the suffering and look at the glory that's coming at the end of that thing. That's what Paul's saying. And he says, if you'll look over there on the other side of that suffering that we're going to do for the Lord, and you look over there at our commitment and our faithfulness and all of this that we've been doing from day in and day out, when it was comfortable, when it wasn't comfortable, when it was convenient, not convenient, when our body wanted to do it, when our body didn't want to do it, let me tell you something. If we'll look beyond that present moment, that present time of suffering, and look over there at the glory that we're going to receive on the other side of that thing, it will not be able to be compared to what we're going to face on the other side. It's going to be glorious. And that suffering won't mean anything. Count me in. That's what he's saying. I'm going to tell you something. This preacher suffers. I get in this pulpit sometimes and I'm going to tell you the gospel truth. I hurt in my body. My body hurts. My back hurts. My brain hurts. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't feel like getting in this pulpit every time I get in. I have to push myself to get up here. So I'm suffering. 
suffering for the Lord to do the work of God because I know that the sheep need to be fed and if they don't get fed, they'll starve. My job's to feed. Amen. God's job is to open your eyes to what you're eating to let you know it's good for you whether you think it is or not. <laughs> you know, when you were sitting at the table at your mama's house when you were younger, your mama used to tell you to eat a lot of things you didn't like. I don't like that. But then your daddy came along and gave you some encouragement. Yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> he got it, didn't you? Yeah. He gave you a little bit of encouragement and helped you out a little bit and motivated you. And you, got, and you realized before the day was over, this is good for me. Because the alternative is bad. <laughs> I'm going to eat this stuff. And later on down the road, you actually realize that it was actually really good for you. Amen. All right, go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1.29. Philippians 1.29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, this is what I just said a few minutes ago, but also to what? For what? See? You shouldn't suffer because of sin. See, you can suffer for sin too now. A lot of people out there create suffering for themselves because of their sin. They're disobedient to God and they're suffering because of their sin in their life. Paul says if we suffer, we should suffer as a Christian, not as an evildoer. We should suffer for being a Christian. Alright, look at the next verse. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. In other words, I'm going to be your example. I'm going to be the example of how you should live and how you should walk and how you should talk and how you should conduct yourself. Study the life of Paul. Study what he did. Study how he was a soldier, a soldier for Jesus Christ and a soul winner for the Lord. Study how that his desire was always in every place he went was to find a church and find a place where he could preach the gospel. Every town he went in, he looked out, he, he, he sought out the brethren. He got him a nucleus of people there, and when he got that nucleus of people there, he said, all right, boys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get over here in this town here in Galatia. We're going to get over here in this town Philippi. And we're going to get over here in this town Ephesus. And we're going to get us a little nucleus built up here and there and there. And we're going to appoint some elders. And we're going to preach the gospel. And we're going to get in there. And we're going to set that town on fire. We're going to shut down the temples of Aphrodite and Diana. We don't care what the politicians think about it. We don't care what the religious folks think about it. We don't care what the church folks think about it. We're going to preach. And we're going to give them the truth and we're going to shake this town up for Jesus Christ. That's commitment. You can't do that sitting home watching I Love Lucy. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Alright. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. Here's the part I was talking about earlier. Let's go back a verse. It is a faithful saying, verse 11, For if we be dead with Him, we shall also live with Him. Now that dead with Him means conversion. That means to be dead. Um, I am crucified with Christ. Okay? That means you're dead, right? When you crucify somebody, they're dead. Alright? So if we're crucified with Him, we're dead with Him. Alright? We shall also what? There's salvation right there. Live with Him. Alright? But that's where Christians most of the time stop. Right there. I say, that's all I need. I just need to be saved. I need to know I'm going to heaven. I need to know I'm not going to hell. And that's all there is to it. That ain't all there is to it, folks. Look at the next part. 
It says, if we suffer, notice the if, we shall also what? <laughs> Reign with Him. But the condition is, if we suffer, we shall reign with Him. If we deny Him, you know how Christians deny the Lord? I don't have to do all that stuff that preacher says. I don't have to do all that stuff in the Bible. I, I just do this little part right here and go along with John 3.16 and that's all I need to do. You know what they're doing? They're denying the Lord Jesus Christ in their, in their lifestyle. They deny the Lord Jesus Christ in their conduct. They deny the Lord Jesus Christ in their speech. They deny the Lord Jesus Christ in their walk. They deny the Lord Jesus Christ in the things He told them to do that they're refusing to do for Him. They're denying the Lord Jesus Christ in the work of the Lord. They, there's all kinds of ways Christians can deny the Lord Jesus Christ. And they do it all the time. And they think because they ain't out there smoking dope and doing liquor and all that stuff that they're not denying Him. But let me tell you something. There's a lot of people sitting in churches across America today that are born again that sit there and deny Jesus Christ every Sunday. And they deny Him in their home, and they deny Him at work, and they deny Him in their family, and they deny, deny Him all the time. They got a form. Because <laughs> we come to church, you know, smile. Hmm? See, I'm religious. I love Jesus. You sure don't act like it during the week. You sure don't act like it when you're communicating with your spouse. You sure don't act like it when you're communicating with your children. You sure don't act like it when you're communicating with your co-workers. You sure don't act like it when you're communicating with other people around you. Do they know you're a Christian? I mean, really know you're a Christian? I mean, know you're a Christian without you verbalizing it. Do they know you're a Christian? And your conduct and your attitude and the way you walk and the way you talk, can they tell it? See, we deny Him. Alright, what does the Bible say if we deny Him? He's going to do what? He's going to deny us. You say, well, that, does that mean I'm going to lose my salvation? No, it don't. It means that you're going to, He's going to deny you a reign. The context there is a reigning with Him. You're going to be on the sideline. I don't know what you're going to be doing, folks, but it probably ain't going to be good. <laughs> I'm just saying. But you might be saved. Okay? Great. Wonderful. You, you, you did the most important thing you could have ever done is give your soul to Christ. I agree with that. But if you think that's all you should do, you sure don't have a very high view of the Lord Jesus Christ, do you? You sure don't think that very highly of Him, do you? All these people that talk about how they love the Lord and how they just He's in their heart and they, they think about Him all the time. Well, why is it that when God tells you to do something, you won't do it? Why is it that the obedience part is the part that you struggle with so hard? My wife has no problem, and I, I'm putting her on the spot, and she'll agree with me when I say this. I'm not, I'm not saying this funny or being sarcastic. I'm being serious right now. My, my wife has no problem at all obeying me. You know, oh, oh, oh my God, he said that from the pulpit. A woman obeying a man. But you know why? Because we have a love for one another. I'm not treating her like a rug that you kick around and walk around on and talk ugly to her and treat her like a dog and beat her like a dog. I treat her with honor and respect and love and I cherish her and I love her as Christ loved the church. I'm willing to lay my life down for her. And I talk to her with kindness and love and, and gentleness and tenderheartedness. So she has no problem obeying that. You know why she has no problem obeying me? Because she loves me. A person that's not willing to obey Jesus Christ don't love Him. You can say whatever you want to. You can give God all the lip service you want to. But if you're not willing to be obedient and put that flesh under subjection, you cannot tell me you love the Lord. Now, y'all, I, I could give you a list of things to think about that God has said that we should do. Y'all heard me harp on it Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, Sunday night after Sunday night. There's all kinds of things. We should pray. Can I get an amen? amen. We should read our Bible. Amen. amen. Went through the whole book of Daniel today, not bragging about it, but I'm telling you, in my busy schedule, I still found time to read the book of Daniel. 
in one day. <laughs> Can't you do a couple of chapters? Amen. You should not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, especially as you see the day approaching. That means when the church is open, you should be there. Short of being sick, short of being in a situation where you absolutely can't come, you should be there. If, you, if your work prevents you from coming, that's one thing. If you're sick, that's another thing. But if you're just laying out to be out because you just want to be a lazy bum, shame on you. Amen. You ought to love Jesus Christ better than that. Than to forsake His house and think that it's not important. What could be more important than coming to the house of the Lord and loving Jesus Christ and listening to His Word being preached? Tell me what's more important than that. Amen. And God told you that He's giving you everything that you have. Amen. He's told you you can keep 90% of it, just give Him 10. And you rascals, stingy, stingy, stingy Christians, sit there and say, I'll keep it all. God says, I've taken note of that. Preacher, you don't understand. I've got to pay my bills. I'm going to tell you this. You've got to get you to a place where you can't pay your bills if you keep it all. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. How about the Lord's table? Why aren't we coming to the Lord's table? Did Jesus say it or not? Yes or no? Did He say, do this? He did, didn't He? He said, take this bread and eat it. <laughs> well, if He said, take this bread and eat it, and you sit there and look at it and say, I don't have to do that. You know what you're doing? You're saying, I don't love the Lord enough to obey Him. You'd rather do your way than God's way. Shame on you, buddy. As Gomer Powell would say, shame, shame, shame. <laughs> Amen. I'm here to tell you, it's where the rubber hits the road is when God says to do things in the New Testament and we don't do it. We cannot sit there and say, Oh, how I love Jesus. And I want to sing, Oh, shut your big mouth until you get serious about serving Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Now, I'm skinning you high. Did I know that? I'm, I'm probably getting a lot of people on YouTube that's mad at me right now. But look, I'm doing it because I love you. I'm telling you things that you need to hear. I'm telling you how to get to that next level in the Lord so you can reign with Him. Amen. You say, well, it's just, a, it's just so inconvenient. What could be more inconvenient than you sitting laying there on your back where God is chastising you? Because you ain't being obedient. I'm telling you, I've seen it, brothers and sisters. I've seen it. I saw a young lady just today... Let me tell you something. I saw a lady today. My wife sent me a picture of her. And this girl sat under my ministry. She heard the gospel be preached. She gave her heart to Christ. At least gave her lip service that she gave her heart to Christ. She got to church for a little bit. I'm going to tell you something. She thought she knew better than God and she decided she she didn't need all that stuff. She could do it her own way. You ever heard that, Frank Sinatra? I can do it my way. See, you can't do it your way. you got to do it God's way. And God put preachers and pastors over you for a purpose because they under, God understood one thing about sheep. They cannot lead themselves. They need a shepherd. Amen. They need a shepherd that can guide them, warn them, and say, hey, there's danger down the road. If you go, keep going down that road, there's some wolves over there ready to devour your behind. That's what the preacher's there to do, to warn you and get you back in the fold so that you don't get out there and get eaten. Now, this lady said, I don't need that, I don't need that, I don't need that. I said, okay. All right. I'm not one to go out there and, and, and beg you and, 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 and beat you over the head about it, but I will tell you this, you're leaving outside of God's will and judgment's coming and God's going to fix your wagon. I saw a picture of this lady today. She's 38 years old. Church, let me tell you something. She looked like a 75-year-old woman on that mobile patrol. I didn't even recognize her. You get outside of God's wheel, God's got some ways of getting your attention and get you back in the fold like you're supposed to be. And then if you don't, 
He'll let you get out there a little further and then he'll, he'll, he'll let that sin work you over real good. Let me tell you something. Sin never pays. If I'm going to suffer, I'm not going to suffer for sin. I want to suffer for Jesus. Amen. Because when I suffer for Jesus, there's a reward. If I suffer because of sin, it's death in the pot. There's death in the pot. He says here, if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. If we believe not, yet He abideth faithful. He cannot deny Himself. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. That's people that run around, Brother uh, Earl, and sit around with about ten different Bible versions and sit there and say, what does your Bible say? What does your Bible say? What does your Bible say? What does the Amplified say? What does the NIV say? What does the New American Standard say? And they sit around and, they, and they're striving about words. Which one is the perfect Bible? Which one's the perfect uh, translation? Which one do you like? Which one do you prefer? <laughs> and Paul says it's to no profit. You ain't never going to learn the Word of God like that. I didn't when I was out there doing it. I stayed confused all the time. Couldn't understand anything. Had no, da- da- no, no sound doctrine whatsoever. None. No sound doctrine. Look at what verse 15 says. Study. He didn't tell you to quit reading the Bible. He told you to study it. To show thyself approved unto God a workman. Uh oh. You know what that means? That's going to require you to do? And you know what a workman does, right? He works. <laughs> God didn't get rid of work because he saved you. He said, Now it's time for you to go to work, buddy, and get busy. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Buddy, that takes some work. You don't think that takes some work. You go over there and pick the book of Daniel up and study it. And try to rightly divide that book. Now, I've got a handle on some things in there, but there's some things in there I'm still working on, Brother Earl. <laughs> I, I think I've got a thing in there where it seems like, and I ain't going to get into this too much tonight, but it seems like there's four different uh, tellings of, like, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John gives the first advent, the book of Revelation gives it four different accounts, and the book of Revelation, I think Daniel set up like that. And the visions that he had, because he had four different visions, and those four different visions seemed to have similarities to them. I don't know yet. I ain't ain't, ain't got that all worked out yet. But I'm studying it. You hear what I'm saying? I'm working it out. I'm working it, buddy. I'm in there hammering away at it, trying to figure it out. All right, take your Bible and let's look at some more here. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let's look at verse 12. And some Christians say they never suffer. Well, you're telling on yourself. You know why? Look at verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall what? And I don't mean a bed of roses. If you're going to live godly, you're going to suffer. And the reason some Christians don't ever suffer for the Lord is because they're not living godly. They're living like the devil. They're living in Laodicea and they're just at ease in Zion and they're sleeping under the willows. <laughs> and they're just and they're just waiting for the days to pass by. Waiting for the Lord to call their name. Come up hither, lazy. <laughs> I'm going to fix your wagon when you get up here. <laughs> You're going to wish you'd stay down there a little longer. Amen. Uh, some Christians ain't looking forward to the Lord to come. Ain't that shameful? Yeah. I've had Christians tell me that. They say, I'm scared to see Jesus come. Why? Because they know they ain't living for Him. Why don't you change that? You still time? Get, get the thing turned around, man. He's plentiful in mercy. He's long-suffering. His, ever, uh, his, his mercy endureth forever. I mean, go read the Psalms, man. He tells you exactly what He'll do for you if you'll run to Him. And get that thing turned around in a hurry and then you can get something at the judgment seat of Christ to lay down before the Lord. Let me tell you something. When we get before the Lord, I want to lay something down at His feet. 
I do not want to go empty handed. And I don't want this local church, and as a pastor over this local church, to go empty-handed. And bless your heart, I don't think we will. I don't think this little church will. I think we've done some pretty um, good things in the work of God here in this little church since we started. Uh, We just sent out another offering to the missionaries in Israel. This month we got missionaries to China, and I think we're going to do one for uh, Uganda as well. Uh, we're going to do two this month, but um, yeah, no, I, I didn't give you the Uganda one. Okay, right. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I've got his information, and I'm going to possibly send him another offering on the side. But listen, folks, those missionaries need us. Amen. I wish we could send a whole lot more than what we're sending, but guess what? You know why we can't? Because God's people are stingy. I know I didn't get an amen there, but it's the truth. If people would pay their tithes, we could do more for the missionaries. If people would give what they're supposed to give in that offering plate, and I don't even pass an offering plate. i got a box back there. I don't try to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot tonight, spiritually. I'm going to get you to think about what you're doing and what you're not doing for Jesus Christ and who you're hurting. You're not hurting me. You're hurting the missionaries. You're hurting the prisoners. There's been times when me and Sister Carrie have had to sit on letters for weeks at a time. We couldn't send Bibles. You know why? Because there weren't anything in offering. These people are hungry for the Word of God and God's people sitting over here fat as a cow and won't even do anything for God. Ain't that a shame? That's shameful. That'll make you hold your head down if you're not doing right. Turn it around. Turn it around. Alright, let's look at this. He says, um, I already live godly in Christ Jesus, shall I suffer persecution. That's not an uh, option. That's a, that's a fact. Alright, let's hit this real quick. Christ Jesus had two distinct things He suffered for. Now, we know one of them, and it's pretty clear on one of them. You know what the first one is? Jesus suffered for our sins. Go to First Peter. Let's talk about the sufferings of Christ for a minute. You should meditate on the sufferings of Christ. You should meditate on it. You should think about it every day. I I, I think about it. That's why I like pictures where Jesus is crucified and stuff. Because it it gives me a visual and reminds me of what He went through. Every, Every Easter season, they have the Passion of the Christ on. And I know Mel Gibson put it out, and I know he was a Roman Catholic and all that stuff. But let me tell you something. When I look at that movie, I'm not thinking about Roman Catholic. I'm thinking about my Lord, my Savior, and what he went through and the price he paid. And that depiction in that movie come as close as anything I've ever seen. Amen. Amen. If you ain't seen it, y'all see it. And y'all look at it and y'all meditate on what God did for you. Because, buddy, He put a price out there that you and I couldn't pay. And He paid it. Think about the sufferings of Christ. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. The just for the unjust. Now notice that. These people to tell you they're wonderful and they're great and they're good people and all that stuff, then Jesus didn't suffer for you. You righteous? Jesus didn't suffer for you then. He didn't die for you. The Bible says He did it for the unjust. That's what my Bible says. Right there. Now either you acknowledge that and say, yeah, I'm, I'm unjust and I needed a Savior and I needed somebody that was justified and just to die for my sins and die in my place. And you know what Jesus did? He suffered for the unjust. Count me in, buddy. That's me. Me too. Me all day long. <laughs> for Christ our self once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also He went and preached unto the spirits in prisons. He went down there into hell and he preached to those people down there and he told them, too bad, so sad, you're out, you ain't getting in, you rejected God in the Old Testament and God's rejecting you in the New. That's the spirits of those that were in prison. 
There's two groups down there he went and preached to. He preached the gospel to the dead, that's the saints in Abraham's bosom, and he preached to condemnation to those that were in prison. He shut the gate and locked it and said, have a, have a nice day, gentlemen. I'm out of here. He never stepped inside. He didn't suffer in hell. Did you hear what I said? He suffered on the cross. He didn't go into hell and suffer. He suffered on the cross. His hell was on the cross. See? Alright, let's look at another one here. Go down here to 1 Corinthians 15. The Gospel. First Corinthians 15. Now look at verse 3. This is the Gospel laid out in three sections. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at what it says. Verse 3. For I have delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How? That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. We say that in the communion. And that He was buried. And that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now let me say something here. We a lot of times zero in on one of those two things or one of those three things. you got to understand, this is a package deal. Jesus had to die on the cross for your sins. Yes. He had to suffer on that cross to get you to heaven. But He also had to be buried as a testimony that He was good and dead and that He buried your sins. And He also had to rise from the dead because if He didn't rise from the dead, everything He had done before that wouldn't matter. Amen. Amen. That's right. you got to have the whole deal or you get nothing. See? It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that a man has to believe to be saved. And if he don't believe that, if he rejects any part of that, he is not saved. Amen. 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 Never mind these people running around and saying, Oh, I believe Jesus spiritually rose from the dead. Well, then you're lost as the devil. If you don't believe in His bodily resurrection, you are not saved. Amen. And if you do like the Jehovah's Witnesses and believe He died on a popsicle instead of a cross, uh, you're not saved either. My Bible says He was crucified on a cross. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you say, what's a popsicle? <laughs> Just go look at any Jehovah's Witness book on the crucifixion and you'll find out what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, and because He took our place and became sin for us, let's look at that, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Be careful of the wording, because um, Joyce Myers and Paula White and Kenneth Copeland and T.D. Jakes and all the rest of those clowns on TV, they can't read English. They don't know how to read English. The devil's got them blind. Look at verse 21. I'll show you what I mean. And it's so subtle that if, you, if, you, if you're not careful and you're not paying attention and you don't know your Bible, you'll get deceived by what they say. Because it sounds so close to the truth, you'll buy into it. The verse says in verse 21, For he hath made him to be what? Say it again. Yeah. Does that say sinner? Well, that's what they say. He became a sinner for you. Yeah. I got the books over there in the library. I show it to you. They teach that he became a sinner on the cross for your sins. And that is not what the verse says. The verse says he became sin. There's a big difference. You say, what's the difference, preacher? The difference is a sinner commits acts against God. That's a sinner. Jesus never committed any kind of act against God. He is God. <laughs> so you're denying the deity of Jesus Christ by the very fact that you would say such a foolish thing. My Bible says He became sin. What does that mean? He took it on Himself. That flesh took inside of its body sin. 
He took it off of you and placed it on Himself. Every sin that you can imagine was placed in the body of Jesus Christ. Every sickness and every disease you can think of was placed inside the body of Jesus Christ on the cross. It wasn't just a physical death that He was laying up there doing. There was something going on in that body that contorted Him and twisted Him and made Him mangle up to the point where the high priest and the people and the uh, Roman soldiers, when they're looking at Him, they said according to the prophecies in the Old Testament as they're looking up at the cross, they say He don't even look like a man anymore. That's how bad it was. You can see that when you look at these mobile patrol people that are 20 years old and look like they're 80. You know what it is? They've taken so much sin inside their body, it has twisted them and contorted them and made them where you can't even recognize who they are anymore. Like we were talking about earlier with the lady that I know. That's what sin does. Sin never, ever, ever pays you good. It'll pay you, but it don't pay you good. And let me tell you, your sin, be sure, will find you out. Amen. 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 And there'll come a time when the light will shine in that dark place and you don't think nobody knows and God knows and He will put a light on it. Alright. He says He became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He took our place. Praise God. When we come to Him and are saved, we no longer have to suffer condemnation for our sins that are under the blood of Jesus Christ. Go to John 3, 18. We won't suffer condemnation, but we will suffer chastisement. Don't you make a mistake that they're both the same. They're not. Every son God receives us, He chastises. If you're here tonight and you're saved, you can recognize that and say amen to that. Amen. Amen, because I can. I'm glad He wore me out. <laughs> I didn't like it when I was going through it, but I tell you what, on the other side of it, I said, praise God. At least I ain't, going, I ain't condemned with the world. Going to hell and not even caring. There's a lot of people out there like that, you know? They're going to hell and don't care. Don't even bother them. Look at John 3, 18. The Bible says, He that believeth on Him is not condemned. That means you're not going to hell. But he that believeth not is condemned already. In other words, your goose is cooked, buddy. He's condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is condemnation. We read this on Sunday morning. That light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds, their deeds, their deeds were evil. Let me tell you something. You can find out a lot about a person by what they do. Amen. And you can find out a lot about a person by what they don't do. You can find out where a person is spiritually by what they do and what they don't do. Amen. It's just, it's, it's just a fact of life. Jesus laid it out right here. He said, men love darkness rather than light. Why don't people come to church? Because they love darkness. Why don't they read the Bible, preacher? Because they love darkness. Yeah. Why don't they go so when they preach? Because they love darkness. What other reason could you give that they don't do it? Give me one. Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That's why they do evil things. You want to know why the kids in school shoot up each other and blow each other's brains out? Because their deeds are evil. You know why? Because they love darkness rather than light. Mom and daddy didn't teach them the truth. Mom and daddy didn't put any light in them. There's a void of light in this country. And I'll tell you something. There's a void of light in the church world. The church world is getting darker and darker and darker and darker as the days go by. And there's a lot of churches out here that sit up and say they're alive, but they're dead. Amen. Now, I mean, you go in them and you see, you can tell, they're not lit up. You have to have a flashlight in some of these churches. <laughs> to see your Bible, seriously. 
Don't bother bringing your Bible. They're not going to read it. They're not even going to tell you to turn to it. They'll have a big projector up, you know, with an ESV laying up there or something. You know, a little, little uh, what do you call it, them little memory verses that you pull out of the box. What do you call them things? They'll, they'll pull it any, many, many, mo, you know, put that up there, and then the preacher will preach on something that ain't got nothing to do with the verse. <laughs> I, I, I know exactly how, man, I can read them like a book. Old Smiley will get up there and say, you know, God wants you to be, you know, God wants you to think positive, and He wants, your, he wants His best for you and all that. A 30,000 member congregation, and He won't never give an altar call. Is he that naive to think that everybody in there saved? Or does he care? He probably don't care. But I had a 30,000 member congregation, but I'd be, I'd be giving all the call every day. I'd get nervous. <laughs> yeah. And somebody in here is not saved and they're not responding. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's plenty of fruit in here to be picked. Anyway, um, go to Romans 5.9. Romans 5 9. Look at this one. Actually, look at 5 8. We're going 5 8 and 9. The Bible says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See that thing? That's where his love was commended at. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Why? Because he loved you? Tense. He poured all his love out at the cross. That's where it's at. That's where it's available. He didn't just throw his love out there like a, a cheap thrill in the night somewhere where anybody and everybody can grab it on their terms. He reserved and protected his love at a certain place and he protects it to where you have to come on his terms to receive it. That's how sacred his love is. His love is not cheap. It's not like a prostitute on the street corner somewhere selling her body to anybody that comes by and pays her a dollar. But that's the way the church world has presented the love of God to the world. God just throws it out there to everybody. No matter what they do, no matter how they receive Him or reject Him, it don't matter. He still loves you. No, He don't. His love's at Calvary. You got to come through Christ to get it. That's what he's saying right here in verse eight, verse nine. Much more than being now justified by what? By His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. You want to get saved? You want to get saved from the wrath of God? That's that's a perfect place for you to point people to when you start talking about the Book of Revelation. And I know everybody in this church has heard it at one time or another. You've talked to loved ones, co-workers, people out on the street, and they all tell you the same thing when it gets to discussing the book of Revelation. That book scares me. Yeah, amen. I may have heard them say that. Let me tell you something. That's a good verse to go to right there. You're scared? You're scared because you're in the wrath of God. And if you want to escape the wrath of God, here's where you get out of it, right here. You don't have to stay scared. Fear of the Lord, yes. Scared of the book of Revelation? Absolutely not. I get a joy and a thrill out of reading it. I look forward to reading it every day. In fact, I read it every day. Honestly, I do. I, I wind up over in the book of Revelation almost every day when I'm reading my Bible. Because there's cross-references that run me right back to Revelation. You know what the Bible says about the book of Revelation? It's the only book in your Bible where God says He'll bless you if you read it. There's a blessing in it. Blessed is he that readeth only book in the Bible that says that. They don't say that in John. They don't say that in Matthew. They don't say that in Mark. They don't say that in Luke. They don't say that in any of them. It says it in Revelation. He said, Blessed is he that readeth. And that's the one book everybody's afraid to read. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That's the one book the devil says, Don't you read that. <laughs> That'll scare you. Well, good. You need to get scared. Get scared for Jesus Christ. Read it. <laughs> It'll do you some good. It'll get rid of some of that devilment out of you. <laughs> Amen. 
Scared the devil out of you. All right, next week we'll pick up there. We'll pick up on number two. Let me mark it. And Jesus also suffered for righteousness. Now, we'll look at that next week. And uh, pick up there and keep going down, and then we'll keep moving on. Anybody got any questions on what we went over tonight? All right, so Sunday night we'll do Q&A. Sunday morning we'll be back on the names of Christ, and then we'll go from there. Okay? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight in closing. Brother Jack, close us in prayer tonight. Lord, we just thank you for the time we come together tonight to listen to your word. We just thank you, God, for the blessings that we get from listening and, and hearing the preaching of your word. Amen. And we just bless you, O oh Lord, and thank you for the things that you're doing in this church. Yes, Lord. And we just praise you and thank you for everything that you're doing for the individuals in this church. Yes, Lord. Thank you. We ask your God that you that you watch over us and us and bring us back together for the next four time in the precious, holy, and righteous name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray. Amen. Amen. Bless you tonight.